Tell me a little bit about, do you, do you remember much about Chicago before you moved to Bexley? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, civil rights, I mean, you right there oh, in yeah. the mid-60s. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, I was young enough to remember it, but not really young enough to do anything about it. I was born in uh, near North. Uh, we moved to Wilmette when I was like oh, very close to zero. My parents built a house, suburb North Shore. Well, yeah, the '60s. Um, sure, um, I lived next to the Emanuels. Was kind of uh, uh, who are quite a family now. Uh, Rom and Ari. Uh, Rom was in the Clinton administration. Yeah. I'm not buddies with them now, but it is interesting because um, there were so many things happening in a very short period of time. And I do remember them all. One is always a peace, Nick. When I was a kid, I wrote to John F. Kennedy. Mm. Got a letter back. I wrote also to, to Lyndon Johnson. Got a letter back from President Johnson, mm -hmm. you know, one of, probably in crayons and telling him just not get out of Vietnam and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So I watched Vietnam on television. Like a lot of people, a lot of televisions, yeah. um, and um, my block was uh, a lot of kids my age, like eight or nine. And I grew up in a school system in Chicago that was one of the top in the country. It's called the Nutri School System, and uh, so they were experimenting with us and all sorts of stuff, which I didn't really know, some kind of reading things. We made films when I was in first grade. Like we 20, we, they'd take 24 frames and we'd draw on the films. Mm -hmm. And we each did it and then they showed the film. And there's my, you know, it's it was really like very uh, analog, but, um, and um, uh, like in seventh grade, right before I moved as an example, I took a class on city planning there was like three of us in there. Yeah. And then we moved to Ohio. Yeah, was that a culture shock? Or major, I mean, major. It was like a completely different type of place. Right? Major. And my parents lived in a townhouse at first we lived. And so I went to a pretty much a white trash school. Mm -hmm. This was like two Jews, my sister and myself in the school. <laughs> Am I kidding? And I, I didn't even think anything about it, but they, they addressed it. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. did you, they asked me if I killed their Lord and things like that. I was like... But after a year and a half or two years, then we moved to a, a home into Bexley, which was a very cobblestone streets, beautiful houses. <laughs> it was a whole different planet. And everyone there was extremely, uh, their father's fathers lived there. Very traditional. Yeah. And yet we had teachers that went through there that were teaching, like I took class in comic vision mm. on death and dying later, my electives, you know. It was like really another a history teacher who had come back from Vietnam and was like anti-war and he was a medic, he had been there. And he was into blowing all of our ideas about what history was, American history. Mm. So that was a little bit about Ohio. My parents, um, my mother hated it. My sister hated it. Mm -hmm. Father was doing the best he could. What was his occupation? My father was sold chairs, oh. and he sold them to stores. You know, like really uh, the kind of chairs people usually don't sit on, but mm -hmm. really lovely, like okay. dining, but beautiful chairs. Mm -hmm. But and he had this territory. He always wanted to come to California. Mm -hmm. That was his dream. He had been there. He was seventeen, mm -hmm. and. My father's God was the sun. Like he would sit out like this with you know, a reflector, <laughs> really intense, Greek, Jew, and love the sun. And um, so eventually he did. He, he took Ohio, it was like for three years or four years to get there. It worked out, it took another year. And then other things happened in Ohio. Last thing to say is it was kind of interesting because of um, when my father moved out here to, to California before my mom, my mom took me to an art show. My mom was studying art and she's an artist and, and she brought me to a gallery. Ava Glimsher was the, it was her mansion in Bexley. Later, Glimsher's of Pace Gallery. 
So that was wild. And I got to a Louise Nevelson show. Mm. And I got to meet Louise Nevelson and major sculptor, just incredible. She had this big New Mexican jewelry on. She was kind of sitting something like this, only like a throne. Like, mm -hmm. you know, she had energy in her hands and we shook. And then I was going around with one of the Glimpshire kids or something. And I'd go in the back room and we got to drink champagne and we were 17 and we thought that was cool. You know, we're looking through Picassos and far too casual were we knowing, in my opinion. So that was a nice memory right before I left for California. After I graduated, I just can't So that's my Ohio years. Going back as a child and your mother being an artist, I come from an artist family too. Mm. One of my first memories is, you know, drawing with my mom and such. Tell me about that. Did did she give you like, you know, the run of the place with some paints or something? Or how did, how did your kind of like I'm instruction- a, I love my mom. She was an artist who was a mother, mm. not a mother who, uh, is an artist and I differentiate between those two some therapy had to look at that <laughs> but um, so she did but we would do things they were just very natural to us we, my mother was doing sculptures at one point and finding trucking parts so we'd have to go to the south side of Chicago really junkyard dogs and the whole bit mm. to find these trucking parts that were gonna work for she did one piece called the muscle man and the ballerina like the spindly parts of the car, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and so she painted these metal, you know, so she was doing interesting things and we would help, sometimes we'd help her. Then she would put us, she'd set us up with paints and stuff in, in, in an area, in a basement. And then um, we went to the Art Institute of Chicago all the time. Mm. I went there with my school a lot, but we went there with my mom many times. And Chicago has terrific museums, Museum of Science and Industry, and uh, I used to see dioramas of incredible of Paleolithic man, and just great, great young education of museum education. And Art Institute is one of the best museums in, in the country, really fine collection of paintings, particularly in the late 1800s, but we would know which rooms to go to. My sister and I, we liked, and you know, there was a Syrah, and there was a, you know, you see everything there. It was really, really great. So that was also part of the, my mom yeah. taking us. Kind we didn't have a choice. Yeah, all the time. Did you have, besides your mother, did you have kind of a mentor in, in elementary school or high school or somebody else who kind of like, you know, that you, learn directly from as far as techniques uh, like that? no <laughs> but but we did um well there was teachers mm -hmm. uh, uh not majors in high school no mm -hmm. um i guess i was pretty fairly independent one thing my mother always uh, do is you know you do your thing mm -hmm. don't don't listen to what other people you do your thing which is a big education yeah. and uh, for me personally, without getting too into the psychology of it, what it forces you is when you have a lot of space to do something, it can be quite intimidating. Mm -hmm. But it also can be um, eventually, if you can come out the other side, you have a very specific voice, mm -hmm. you know. And so that was a major thing. My mom, my sister, and I. She, you know, we. She didn't. We. Both, my sister's an artist as well, but she, she didn't say do this and you do that and you have to do it like I do it. Right. it was the opposite. That's good. Yeah, I agree with you. With the, there is though, uh, kind of in a different thought, in a different way to look at it. I do feel like having some constraints, some limitations. Mm. It does help you, even creatively. Right? Like, okay, I'm going to use these four paints. Yeah. Or I'm going to use just these tools. Or my, my point is, stuff. I had to find that out yeah, in, yeah. in a hard way, yeah. in a way, and even in painting, in my imagination. Um, and I found limitations to be quite freeing, mm -hmm. is what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And, um, and not uh, in the opposite. Now, some people, if they're raised in a heavy, a very, very formal ha household and academia and stuff like that. But um, one of the other things I learned from was my, my Nona, my grandmother, my dad's side of the family. She cooked. Mm -hmm. 
and she baked, and she made beautiful looking foods of different forms and shapes. Um, she's from Shanakale in Turkey, and she would make coils of phyllo dough with, which she's in, you know, and fill them with uh, spinach, or then she'd make triangles, and then she made, or, you know, and the smaller ones were full of pumpkin, and but they're very delicate. And they're kind of beautiful. And then she'd make these half crest, crest shaped um, cookies that were full with walnuts and stuff. A lot of, I know it's just shapes and form, but there's only three shapes in the physical universe. But you know, she she did uh, very artistic in that way, and she did, would never consider herself in that at all. Yeah. yeah but that it was interesting to grow up with that, yeah. and I, I really liked it. Uh, let's talk about. Further your education after high school, you get a BFA. Now, tell me about the decision to go to San Diego, because that's pretty freaking far from my. Oh, San Diego. Okay. And, and, and tell me about what what got you interested in, in film and theater. Uh, you know, because the mid seventies, that's like the movie brats. That's when you know all that's happening. Where yeah, you know, like all those famous movies in the seventies. Right. Connection. Right. Oh, stuff. right. I love those, those movies. All those guys, yeah. you know, all freaking, all the well, I, I love, Alma, all those guys. Love those guys. movies. Almost your generation. Oh, like completely. Movies. No, I absolutely love those movies, yeah. and I would go to those movies all the time. It was the golden age of cinema, if you ask yeah. me, in a way, in American okay. cinema, because now I would say, in retrospect, because there were no cell phones in the movies there was a there was a dramatic tension that could be created but also there's a grittiness and a very um free so what got me into that um uh, my dad always loved movies big time and we shared that and i he would always like see a movie would be watching movies and he'd come up with some very obscure actor's name oh Lewis Stone, the popular Lewis Stone. I'm like, Dad, no way. And then you'd see at the end, you know, the scroll up, Lewis Stone. I'm like, how that? <laughs> Very, <laughs> we have this strange connection with that. So my dad uh, influenced me with that. But when I went to uh, college, we moved to California. Went oh, to, the family moved yeah, the whole family moved here. To where, where city? Tarzana, California. Oh, okay. And lived okay. up in so, Hills. So why not UCLA or USC? Why San Diego? One is um, I didn't study a lot. Mm. <laughs> I didn't have great. Well, actually, as out of state, I could have gotten into UCLA, but the first year it was going to cost a lot of money, and I was like, "Well, I could just take these general education." So I, I took a, a city college. I went to Pierce College, and I started doing radio there. Oh. And um, uh, I always liked to do that. I had a whole thing of voice, and so. I started doing radio and music and radio interviews. I was into jazz and all different kinds of music. And that eventually got me into, uh, then I was like ready to go to university, you know, uh, a major one. And San Diego State had a really good telecommunications and film department. And I'm a hedonist, I guess, you know, and it was beautiful down there. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm a, you know, beauty. Okay, yeah, yeah. back it up, beep, beep, beep. Yeah. So I was like, Oh, this is great. And I went down there and um, the radio got me into this department, which was kind of like a very select called telecommunications and film department. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did some radio there, but then I immediately started doing films and then acting. I don't know what got me into it. I auditioned. I got into some things and I was suddenly a uh, minor in drama and telecommunications and film. Mm -hmm. And I was doing all sorts of, this is the 70s too, you know, a, a movement and mime. And I was learning, one of my teachers taught the Mao Tse Tung exercises. It was like really wild stuff we were doing, uh, you know, things like that. And um, I was a romantic and so also, and you know, quite a bit. And uh, I was always searching for uh, a language. Yeah. Did you have aspirations at the time of, okay, I'm going to the school and I want to come out being a... Painter or something? Yeah. Well, no, not... not the, oh, an school. actor? An act, no, I was doing or theater. Or, or, yeah, what I did was, I did this. Um, I, I, I didn't even want to continue college after about two or three years, but I, but, but I did. And I finished, 
and I bought, took whatever money I had and I bought a one-way ticket to Europe. Oh, wow. And I went to... A one-way ticket? Yeah, one-way ticket. And I was like, well... I don't know what they were thinking, but they were like, okay, you're, well, he'll come, yeah, whatever, you know. I did get some letters, like, you know, to get back here. But, but I wound up going to England. I knew some people, so I traveled all around England for a month. And then I went to Amsterdam, fell in love in front of a painting, a Rembrandt painting in, in the Rijksmuseum. I uh, met this German woman, and it turned into a whole thing for many, many, many years. Um, back and forth, but um, I had a Eurail pass in those days. And so what that would enable you to do, once it started, it started in Amsterdam, they put a date on it and you have this pass and I, whatever I paid, I think I paid another $40 so I could have a first class pass. It was like, you know, and um, it means you can get on a train anywhere over this period of, I've been traveling a month already, but for two months, um, using this and go on first and you know go anywhere you want almost in Europe all around Europe even into Greece and stuff so I did I went from Amsterdam I went to Paris met a friend of mine there who was going to college and uh, he, he was finishing up at stuff at, in Italy and he was in Paris and uh, we met up there and you know did whatever we did and hung out and we all walked went around and saw some museums and went to Louvre whatever and um, then I eventually, I, I went to a lot of things. I was really could not get enough. I was, um, went to the Cannes Film Festival. Mm. I went to the Grand Prix in, uh, in Monte Carlo. Wow. Um, and all this was done, I mean, on a song. I don't know yeah, how that, how'd you pay for all uh, there was your rail pass. There was, um, no, I was staying at hostels, you know? I was not really the great, there was no, cell phones there's no wiring of monies it wasn't like i was sitting with all sorts of i have it was a lot less expensive at that time to be clear it was 1980. Mm, okay. okay and what happened was i wound up i got cast in a movie in italy i went to cinecita uh, and i said you know sono attore and they say attore which means i'm an actor and they say Oh, I thought it officia quindici, which means I go to the office fifteen. I'm like, okay. So I walked and I auditioned for like the Sophia Loren story. I was like going to play some American so and they I think lied to me or they said I was cast and I I was staying in a pensione, so it wasn't like there was no cell phones or emails. Didn't hear from them in a week. I'm like, okay, running out of money at that point and. Um, I had been traveling all around Italy and meeting the German girl and going up there and back and forth. It was crazy. And my Eurail pass was going to be out in about two weeks. So I went to Greece, visited some family, my grandfather. It was a big long trip. I'm, this is a long story. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm rambling on. Okay. So I went up going to... The show is now about this. Okay. No, no problem. So all, look, all I went to Greece and... Uh, family is in northern Greece and there's most of the Jews were killed there in World War II but there's a couple left and it was my father and my grandfather's cousin you know I'd never met him he didn't know about me you know and I met his son and uh, it was pretty intense numbers on the arm he had been you know uh, he had these big thick glasses because the Americans had blown up the train tracks on it while it was heading to the his train was heading to the camps and shrapnel and crazy stuff. Meanwhile, I had been seeing a German woman, <laughs> which they probably weren't too happy to know, or they just kind of like, but the, the, the kitchen smelled exactly like my Nona's kitchen in Chicago. It was kind of wild. Did that, did the family roots thing, went to Corfu, romance, different women. I was doing that all along the way. You know, and so uh, then I went and I decided I was going to go back up to Germany to see this woman. And I had a, I, I'd met an artist, I was not an artist at the time, who saw, you know, my pass was up. He changed the numbers on the pass. <laughs> I think that, I think I won't go to jail now, right? I think I'm good. So 
the four was changed to a six and the six was changed to an eight. Like they were very shallow the way they made them and the way they make eights in Europe, you know, in Amsterdam. So I had another two months on there and I, and I had to use some acting abilities because I was like on the train and they were just like, like in Germany, freaked me out. And they were like, you know, you hand the pass and they're like, You know, it's like that extra moment. <laughs> and I'm like, my heart. <laughs> it was pretty bad. So, but, but I got up there, whatever. Didn't work out with her in like a couple of days. We just get, you know, and I said, fuck it. Excuse my language. I said, fuck it. So I just, I auto stopped to Berlin. I had heard that I could always get a job with the military. I once worked with children before over summertime. And I got a job within 24 hours. Um, working for the U.S. military, teaching drama and theater, I wrote. Yeah. So this was actually before you went back to school for painting in Otis, right? All that before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, came to L.A., yeah. thought I was going to act. After I was there for a while, I came back to L.A. to act and uh, uh, got in a bunch of plays, did some Bertolt Brecht plays, and did that for about a year and a half, two years. And I, I, Then I started drawing and painting after that and I was into that and gave it do up. You, do you look, I'm assuming you look back on some of those performances and that experiences with fond memories. Do you miss the performative aspect to that? No. No. Uh, I've lived in Los Angeles long enough where I see the, uh, I always like the art. Yeah. All the business around it, particularly in that field, uh, I, ne I, couldn't, I couldn't take it at the time. It was just, I, when you're 23 or something or 22, you know, if someone gives you something and says, ah, maybe we'll have it, right? Well, you don't, maybe not. And the waiting is, in, oh, it's, it's tor it was torture for me. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't handle that. Yeah. But art could be making art, and you know. Yeah. So what I did was I worked for a, vid a company. I, I had to keep working. I always had jobs. And they, they sold B-movies. <laughs> on video and they made some like horror movies and stuff and there was a cute girl I was an editor and I was in the editing room I took a film I was messing around so I came up with these film glasses as an idea and turned into a whole business of it for about a year and that sent me into design school and to art school and going to night school at Otis Parsons mm -hmm. Uh, was it, tell me about your experience at Otis. Was there anything specific that kind of stands out? Something that like you really um, felt you got? There were some great teachers. Did. Yeah, yeah. There was a teacher named I think Barry Farr, brilliant color teacher. Mm. I learned a lot about color. We used to have color paper, and you'd have to do addition and subtraction of color, which sounds very basic, but no, it's it's. To me, it's like a, it opened up a world to me about color. I had some ideas about color, but yeah. I had some basis to understand colors. Well, your from that. art is super color. I mean, I feel like color is color, shape, you know, form, but your work is, I feel very much about color. Yeah, well, this exhibit, which we'll talk about, I have coming up, is called True Colors, and, and it's, that's why they want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't always. No, I'd say more about in the last four or five years. I Well, it always had color to it, but I think I've come out of my shell about it, mm -hmm. pretending that it was, you know. Was it more kind of line work? Or was more I was glazing that? work so much. I don't think the application of color I've learned better mm -hmm. after many, many years, yeah. which makes a big difference to how color is red. It's not about the color. Mm -hmm. Always, you know. What? Let's go back, actually, because I do want to... Yeah, we'll get into that yeah, later. We'll, sure. We'll get to that in a second, but let me sure. go back to Berlin. Oh, yeah. Tell me about how long were you living there in West Berlin? Oh, I was in West Berlin for about six months. I lived in the Free University. Uh, they had like a, like a what is it, uh, like a dorm kind of thing, but it was oh. my room, you know. Yeah. Um, what's, the there, big, what's the biggest differences between West Berlin and... and color and black and white. I went to the east. I did go to the east. Oh, did 
Yeah, I had a stamp, a military stamp on my passport. So I was getting like, you know, I could buy like a carton of milk for 25 cents or something, you know, whatever it was. It was, it was cool. Yeah. So I wasn't making money, but I wasn't spent. It was really, it was kind of cool. So when I was living in there, first of all, there was a lot going on politically. Because um, Berlin Wall went down like 80, 89. 89. But the summer I was there, in retrospect, was the beginning of the fall of the East. Um, uh, in, um, in Yugoslavia, near northern Greece, where my family is from, Tito had died. And that was a big fall for that area. Tito kind of held things together, although he was a ruler. Um, in West Berlin, when I was there, there were some guys coming through from Detroit that were going on to Poland. Poland was very close to West Berlin, to Berlin. And they were going to deal with the shipyard guys, which was eventually Lech Valenza, who they dealt with. And they were going to give them some advice on how to unionize, which broke the ship builder, ship, you know, making union, I believe, and eventually infiltrated into the Polish government and all that stuff. So there was that political underside. Then all the people in West Berlin that were German, in order to avoid going into the German military, let me express, ex explain this, maybe you know, without getting into a whole tutorial. West Germany's here. Then there's three roads, I think, maybe there was four roads, that led to West Berlin. Everything around West Berlin is the east. Mm -hmm. So West Berlin's here, divided in half, and then there's East Berlin. Mm -hmm. East Berlin was controlled by the Russians. So West Berlin was the American sector, the French sector, and the British sector, which you probably know that. But and the, and so I went through Checkpoint Charlie for a day. I wanted to see what that was about. They give you they gave you coins that were really light, and you walk through this Checkpoint Charlie. It's total propaganda on both sides. And then when you get there, there was something called one major street called the Unter den Linden. You'd walk and you'd go down it and. I tried to get off of it, but there was guys with guns, like Vopos, and you can't, you can't do that, and they let you know that. Verboten, you know, and so, and then you go into the square and you see the whole hammer and sickle, and in 1980 that was, you know, international media was not connected. You don't know what's happening everywhere in the world. So I was um, in for quite a shock, even going to West Berlin, when I hitchhiked, there were literally guys, you can only go 60 kilometers, or you can't go too fast. There were guys with binoculars, just like the movies, wow. on the bridge with guns and all that, the Vopos. East Germans, I think, did not really like the Russians, but that was a whole nother plan. I, I wasn't in on it, yeah. but um, I also liked all these spy movies, and I was very fascinated by all that. And I really got something happened one night i could tell you it was kind of interesting maybe you could just cut this out but it was, i when i i brought a woman home we went out to a jazz club and uh was that the jazz back great then? jazz i got to see a uh, memphis slim oh great music in west berlin at the time i went to tokyo last year and i'm a jazz nerd too oh you are okay and i went and tokyo's i mean japan's fantastic oh yeah too, so I was like, riverside oh. label so I was yeah. really into that. So I'm curious of how. Yeah, uh, you know Memphis Slim. No, I don't. Memphis Slim left in the '50s uh, and went to uh, to Europe. And Europe, of course, was treating black players with dignity. Yes. America was not. Right. And <clears throat> I'd see him. So I went to go see him this particular night. And I took this girl named Orla, and there wasn't a romantic thing. But I brought her back to her place, and we were. You know, it was yeah. drinking, and it was 3, 4 in the morning. And, and she was kind of in the middle of nowhere. I had to get back. And I, you couldn't really call a taxi. It was, so I had to walk a long way, even to, like, civilization. And then, you know, and then from there, maybe I get back to my place and for university. So a car pulled up. I was alone. It was a Lincoln Continental. This is, like was like out of the movies Ugh. windows down <laughs> windows down no i was like okay well you know i need a ride mm. so i'm going up to clay ali you know and they're like 
okay? I got in the front, there's a driver, and then there's a guy in the back. And the guy in the back wasn't, but looked like Khrushchev, like a face that you would, was built to not be remembered. Right, wow. Like it was sandpapered, wow. but red and ruddy. He was Russian for sure. And they asked me a series of questions. And I was like, okay. You know, and they're asking me, how long are you? First, it, it wasn't a casual conversation. It was like an interview. It was a little odd. How long have you been in Berlin? You know, how long do you intend to be here? Where are you? And so I got to a point after like a few minutes, I was like, oh, you know, as soon as I saw like any kind of, you know, you can let me out up here. No, I'm good. I'm good right here. You know, I was like, <laughs> I got out before they could even. And they were like, they weren't going to keep me in there, but that was a weird one. Yeah. And then someone from the U.S. military, too, were like, he was dressed nicely. Because you could take buses around. Mm. Yeah, and they, so that was some of my Berlin stories. But Berlin, music was great. There was music festivals, Festival of Fools. It was, it was a lot of interesting stuff going on in West Berlin. And it was very um, progressive. Very. And literally going to East Berlin, it looked like the war ended on Tuesday. Yeah. Like, yeah. like to, uh, it was bizarre. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So that's my Berlin. What your experiences? Um, you're in, you're in uh, art school now. You're, you're learning about color. You're learning about painting and so forth. Mm -hmm. Tell me, let's, let's talk about art. Let's talk about your inspirations. Was are there some artists that you're inspired by? Give me your top, your top guys or girls. Oh, sure, sure. Well, um, I like a lot of people, you know, uh, I was falling in love with being an artist. Not always being an artist. <laughs> okay, so that's, I get that. Yeah. So I did a lot of meditation, a lot of spiritual work. So there was an influence on that end of things. Now, of course, I love Paul Clay, you know, or I like, uh, you know, Vasily Kandinsky. Um, um, I, I'll just tell you two quick personal experiences, and it led me to bookstores. Um, I basically, I had a, my best friend who were into jazz, and he had, uh, when I was 23, he killed himself, and I was devastated, and then I had some other losses house burned down, crazy, like very dramatic events in a period of about a year and a half. I was putting myself through therapy and there was a Dutton's bookstore down below and I was buying art books up. So I was self-educating in addition to going to school and I was buying all these Eastern European art books that were inexpensive, but just great. So, and I have a memory, I could remember these things. So. I was looking a lot, of course, early on when I was studying, I was studying Cezanne and I was studying um, how he worked in patches of color. I thought they were shaped like Ohio, you know, <laughs> things like that. And um, different tones of the same color. And um, I love Rothko from the get-go. Um, Jackson Pollock, I like, but I, I, you know, I prefer Rothko actually. And Love de Kooning. Um, took me many years to understand de Kooning. I'm doing it because of my studies of him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He's a hard bastard. To do. He's hard to try to like emulate. It. And I, I just learned actually he rotated his paintings a lot. Oh, yeah. While he was doing so when you paint overview, and I've done that even here, it's a very different painting. And you have to be aware of it. And I think now, I think that if you. You don't, it, uh, in my opinion, it's, if you make it difficult for the person that's viewing the work to locate themselves, the painting becomes more complex and problematic. Um, if you're coming from a bird's eye point of view, I mean, Baselitz, George Baselitz turns it upside down, you know. But de Kooning, first of all, I loved his ethic. I got the feeling he was putting the, the overalls on and he was in the barn and yeah. the Hamptons or whatever yeah. and he was doing his thing. Yeah. Now they're all drunks too. So that's <laughs> let's let's not let's not you know and I'm not and I'm not gonna romanticize that. Yeah, yeah. 
and I'm a lightweight. I can't. I, I never. Uh, it, I don't get really high or drunk, or I don't really do any of that stuff and have because I just uh, whatever. But but um, so you have to kind of understand that as a lens, and they were macho as hell, you know. But the, uh, the problem with something small, working on a smaller canvas, yeah. is every mark means so much. Oh gosh. And you're suddenly, you make a mark like this, and it changes the composition of the painting. No, you're right, right. And so you have to be aware of that. So if you're addressing it, you address it for what it is and not try to make it into something else. Yeah. So I don't automatically uh, take a bigger painting and go, I've got to be more physical. Yeah. But you can't deny a physicality is required of the format of that. Yeah. And... Um, so uh, there's a combination between masculine and feminine uh, kind of um, qualities in a Jungian kind of way is how I feel about yeah. painting. So de Kooning, I think, had a combination of those two. Um, Rothko, I think, was um, more of a Buddhist in that manner. I don't know if he's one or the other. Um, I'd say Pollock was very masculine in in his physical you know and um and and i think uh helen frankenthaler because of the way she was moving paint around on the floor and stuff it's very feminine though it's very soft so working in opposites in a taoist kind of way mm -hmm. is very much something that interests me yeah and I the mean, well i mean you look at like georgia o'keefe who's like mm -hmm. super feminine. I mean, those mm -hmm. flowers and everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm, look, I'm looking right now at your work, and I would say you align much more with the feminine, these pieces at least. I, I, do, I do, I do, I do. palette and the, the line marking. I do, I do. It took me a while to kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I guess I do, I do. Um, I do, uh, you know, but, but it's... Uh, Sometimes it can lapse into uh, uh, Eastern kind of uh, like a, maybe Japanese or in Chinese, you know, watercolor. You know, painting with water, which I, I work with oil, but water, they say, you know, the most difficult thing to draw is water. Go draw water for a couple decades and then, then you learn how to paint. So there's a fluidity which I think is important in painting. And um, there's a harmony, potential harmony and disharmony, you know, that you can play with, so. Your work, um, I mean, when I look at it, it does kind of evoke an emotion of calmness to me. Do you kind of, do you kind of, when you're working on something, do you have like a, an emotional kind of like resonance you're trying to reach out and maybe maybe you're like these aren't calm. I don't know if it's calm or not but, but for I do maybe I do just the, maybe it's just the tones or, or the values I do um, not everything needs to interconnect and, and to blend but I've as of late I've been in love with the quality of sfumato which is smoke and you know and and the blending and unioni, you know, to union, you have a union of forms. Um, but um, there is, um, you know, if you're painting more realistic uh, landscape or something, you're going to be playing with scale and foreground and background, and you're going to have harder edges of those, and, and you might have a harmony in repeated forms. You have a form like this, and you have a tiny little form like that, you know, the eye will go from there. And there's something happening in between those two spaces, and it's how you, how you uh, compositionally put it together. So I think about stuff like that. On the left side of the canvas is always a challenge for me, um, more than others. Um, I always feel it's, I want to tighten it up a little bit more, a little bit more like that. And many times I cut into the left side of the canvas. I am very Western, and I think from left to right. And there's different kinds of paintings I think about. Some are narrative in a traditional way, and some are narrative in a pictorial way. So, yeah. Um, 
have you always been, so you've not always been kind of drawn to this kind of abstract? Oh, you asked about some of my, my, my influences. Do you want me to answer that question? I didn't really give you an answer on that, and then I'll answer. Okay, the answer on that, the influence, I had some great, well, I told you about the color. There was a, 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 um, a teacher named Franklin Legal, Legal who was very about texture. Now, um, I was drawn to classical painting, but um, probably I didn't want to um, address what that would take to become a classical painter. Um, I looked into schools in Minnesota that in this country that do that and cast drawings and um, um, but the abs abstraction has always been uh, right from the get-go was was for me in a lot of ways and what I wanted to say but I didn't always know what I wanted to say but I thought I gravitated towards it mm -hmm. Now this is mid a mid to late eighties, so you're also like there's the huge New York scene with Basquiat, Warhol. Hardy, Hardy. First of all, no one was painting in the mid to late eighties. In the early eighties, when I was not painting, I was bartending at art openings and stuff like that. Um, L.A. had a scene downtown, but in New York were the art stars. Julian Schnabel, I liked his work. I love Clemente's work which was more, for me, um, poetic, I guess, in a, in a way. But Schnabel, I liked and was influenced, and I, and I thought he was a home run hitter. And still is, you know, he just, he struck out sometimes. Yeah. Totally struck out. Yeah. And then other times it was like, he, he really did that, he went for it. And I saw the plate paintings, you know, um, and ceramic work, uh, Margot Levin. I had was writing, and I saw um, I went and inter uh, inter I, I reviewed uh, John Michel Basquiat. I went to the opening at the uh, Gagosian Gallery in Ho you met West him Hollywood. You uh, yeah, he was there. Yeah, he was this close. I, I uh, think. Yeah. What year was it? That was in '82. I wasn't oh, even painting yet. Okay. okay. I was just yeah, starting so to. So he, he was still like on top of things. Yeah, I, I wouldn't know or not know. I was just, uh, but I did write about it, and I went and looked at the work. It was a what, very. What did you think of it? I still have the review somewhere. I loved it. I said it was like an African kindergarten. I thought it would, you know, which is probably politically not correct to say, or I don't know anymore. But I love this scat scatological. I think is the word, but. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm a jazz fan, so he did yeah. Dizzy, and he did, you know, um, he did uh, Coltrane, and he also did Joe the Short Order Cook. He had this, yeah. and they were all bought up, and the guy that bought them was Eli Brode. I was oh, really? there, yeah, but Eli Brode bought the large. I remember the most expensive paintings were ten thousand dollars. But anyhow, I went to that, and I so. I looked at that stuff um, as much as I could. I wasn't traveling to New York much. I went once or twice. George Condo? Condo? Not uh, yet. I mean, no. What, what, did you, have, do you like his stuff at all? Or? I do. I just saw it at Hauser Worth about yeah. three months ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's over here in uh, West Hollywood. West Hollywood. I went yeah, to that show. That was great. That was great. That was fun. I was like, oh, this is cool. This yeah, is great yeah. space and a great show. Yeah. Um, George Condo is... Um, Kind of do the same stuff, though. I mean, you know. He's doing the same. What he? Well, 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 hang on. I gotta be careful. But okay. So I, I did buy a book. Of oh, books. you do the cut. No, oh, his oh, stuff. Oh, his stuff. Well, I felt like. I mean, he's he started doing masters. He did sure, he likes Picasso. He and he's big Picasso, stuff. right? But then the stuff that was shown a couple months ago felt like very much like the stuff that he did long time ago, forty years ago. Yeah. And that's not bad. Yeah. I mean, no, I he like is a very. I think he's very, he's so, I don't know him at all, but I think he's so educated uh, in certain periods of art history that I think he's locked, it's, it influences him very heavily. Good or bad, I don't know, but um, he can draw. He's left-handed, I believe. So the way he draws is, to, you know, it's a little different, but he's, he can really draw and and he's articulate as a painter or as a person, from what I've heard him talk. Um, and uh, he he hit with some of those paintings, quite a, yeah. quite a few yeah. of them. 
I think. Some did not make it, but I thought they were great. I wonder the scale is enormous, too. They're good on beautiful scale. I mean, well, when you think about that, uh, let's just kind of go right into it. Like, do you think he, or maybe talk about yourself, too, you know, he's at the canvas, he's like, okay, I know what sells, I know what works. Is that part of the calculus that he goes through no. in mind? You I don't know, know his personal yeah. find. I'm sure he's doing well enough where they didn't matter, like um, I think he's smart enough to know that it wouldn't uh, it, it's it, yeah. he, he owes it to his art to to not get into that does, it, does that come in your mind at all the calculus as far as like okay I know no, like I, I mean, this type of vibe no I, it would when I was a younger painter but no not no, for a long like, time part of it is that I'm an absurdist and that's helped me survive as an artist. Um, I've started painting full time about 20, probably uh, longer than that, probably since 1999. But I've been painting since 1985. I guess it's, you know, a long time. So, so yeah, yeah. And even though I started a little later, but yeah, I've been painting a really long time. And if you put some that much time into something, you really got to really you can't be responding to what you would consider a possible changing marketplace or um, I don't work on a lot of commissions I used to some when I used to work with designers uh, a little bit in the end of the 90s early 2000 yeah she would you know we would work something out but ultimately um, that's not the kind of artist I am yeah Stein, you know, that's a lot of a lot of everything is uh, always personal to me. Um, in the way you're asking me, um, Warhol, I thought was um, and is. I never was a Warhol fan per se, but I've come to reevaluate a little bit. I think Warhol put, and it's very very difficult to understand within today's context he put media on his palette so he used that as part of something he played with and he moved art there's certain artists who move art in a direction whether you like it or not yeah. and so I respect that yeah. I'm not happy about that necessarily but he moved in a particular direction um, there's some artists that just make great paintings or great sculptures and they move people with their work and maybe ultimately they move art in a direction but um, he changed art history with regards to that now uh, spiritually I think is interesting if you look at one thing like a soup can mm -hmm. and it's a common object in the 1960s and you look at it you know however many times 15 times mm -hmm. and you keep seeing it and maybe if you're looking at it in a, a, a different context other than uh, your, your, your cupboard, you're like, oh, this has aesthetic value and I'm really looking at it and maybe I'm getting more into the present mm -hmm. by looking at it. Mm -hmm. So for that, Orho, thumbs up. Mm -hmm. He came from advertising, yeah. you know, came from Pittsburgh, you know, all right, whatever. You know, he, he was an interesting character in that way. I also, my sister met him once a long time ago in Chicago and she said it was like looking into a mirror his eyes were like so and I could see that he's very you know was, so and I think about art the last thing I'll say about that is about reflection mm -hmm. there's some paintings and some artists that you can actually look at their work and it leads you to inner reflection mm -hmm. and some use materials metallics and other things that literally, not in a narcissistic way, but they, they get you literally to reflect right back at you. So it's impenetrable. Well, it seems like it's in a reflection, but it actually, it's, it's, a, it's a way of pushing away intimacy. So I think that's interesting with Warhol. I think he has that quality too. Yeah. Lichtenstein, when I was a kid, uh, my parents, uh, whatever, they wound up buying a print signed by uh, uh, Lichtenstein, oh, wow. an artist proof, and 
it was for very inexpensive. It was for a charity thing, and it was your hel your melody haunts my reverie. So with the blonde girl like this, oh, and, you know, yeah. and and you would know this. Now I we had that. I grew up with it, and it was made in this is 1967. And I've learned about Lichtenstein over the years. So my dad, towards the end of his life, he had to he ran out of money and he had to he sold it. And Lichtenstein died like a year later, early. But the, it was he sold for a lot, but it would have been like another zero on it, yeah. you know. One of those. Now, Lichtenstein, I tried to do in my first paintings. I tried to do not the small dots, but when I was in high school, I took chicken wire. Yeah. And I did like a man behind Chico. Yeah. So I did it in a very, very crude analog way yeah. with acrylics, Liquidex yeah. acrylics. I was using at the time, I believe. So that was, so one is personally, I had that print around my house all the time. It was very personal. And I, you know, what I learned about it from a collector in Florida, Marty Margulies was lecturing some people down in, in, uh, in Miami big, huge collector, and he was lecturing young collectors. He knew Lichtenstein and was friends with him, and collected a lot of Lichtensteins. He said the ones that became the most valuable, I think prior to 1965 or 66, some of, he didn't have the dot thing down pat yet, the technique, and some were blurred. And those are a lot more valuable now than the ones that are perfect. So that pop, that was also pop, and that also would not be what I consider inner reflective, but more um, social, cultural kind yeah. of commentary. Yeah. And so that's not the field I operate in at all. I'm yeah. a bit more romantic in Rothko or the mid-century artists in that way, but you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, your work is kind of traditional painting, yeah. I'm saying, I don't know if this is the right word, language, but just mm -hmm. with my my. Okay, you know, sure. It's, it's kind of traditional. It's kind of a, I don't know, old school, but it's it's not you know the newest stuff happening. Maybe I'm wrong. No, you're right. Do, do you feel like the need to know what's going on down in I don't know Silver Lake or whatever the coolest spot is? Honestly, and, and to I, see that vibe. And, do you feed in that? I'm always going there. I, I have rituals. I go out for coffee every day. I'm out around all the hipsters, and I see all this stuff. Yeah, I'm not locked into going to clubs late at night. I'm not doing that kind of stuff anymore. But, um, And I look at it not with jaundice eyes. I just look at it. And just look. Does it infiltrate uh, my paintings? Maybe it does in, in a nuanced way. Um, you know, everything doesn't have to uh, to break open new windows. I don't think nothing's new either. I don't, I, you know, the whole, yeah. you know, look, you can walk into a coffee shop every day, the one you love, and have a totally different experience every day and love it, you know, and really it's a challenge to be able to approach something and to really see it with really fresh eyes and fresh heart and fresh, you know, vision. And that's a very important challenge, I think. Um, and if you can do that, that's why I even mentioned Warhol, like looking at a soup can, as if you've never even tried or knew anything about that soup, you know. So it's a challenge that I think is important to remain present. Yeah. Because everything's always a little bit different anyhow. At the same time, when you go to a painting and you're making a painting, I work in oil, so I don't do it all at once. You know, I work, come back a day or two days later or something. You know, it's getting tacky or whatever. Things are happening where I have to let the paint dry to some extent. I, it's a muscle to be able to go back to that painting and to match the tone in the vibration I was at when I left that painting. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, still see it new. Mm -hmm. And that is a key muscle that most artists don't talk about because, you know, 
it's it's not about like you just go back and you just kind of wing it and then you pull it together and you can make it a nice painting. And you can do that. But I think it's interesting if you can match a vibrational kind of quality, whatever it is you're doing, realistic yeah. or, or abstract, it should not matter. Yeah. And so, and that's a discipline. And it's a very, very nuanced thing. And it's very personal between whatever the artist and his work or her work or it work, its work or whatever. So what is fresh out there? What is new or what is, do I feel a need to stay connected? Look, I'm affected by world events or by uh, personal life events and by, and um, probably, and it would never be necessary, but if someone wanted to catalog and go, oh, he's breaking up with his girlfriend or blah, blah, I could see he did this, you know. I did a painting, I was into the idea of hypnagogic. Okay, and that's like kind of right when you close your eyes and you begin yeah. to, I did this very large painting very large that was looked black but it was really aubergine color oh sorry yeah it looked black but it was really aubergine in color and just barely some some light coming through and stuff and I was going through a divorce at the time I, I never even saw the connection of that to like four years later so maybe there was a direct connection psychologically so I'm not impervious to the events and they do make their ways into my painting, but maybe on a more personal level. And um, I'm not a protest painter or um, ready to do Guernica 2 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, I was talking to an artist about, you know, selling work and just like getting shown in a gallery and, and a lot. And the, the conversation moved to, you know, Art collectors, people who buy mm. art, really want a story. They're buying this artist because of mm. this vibe, and he's you know you go to the broad, and there'll be an exhibit, and there's like mm. a message here, and it's about the, yeah. There's know, a lot of that. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And, and I'm no. just like, I'm just at the stage of my art where I just I just want to be technically good and like do something that I feel is quality, not about here's my my treaty on world peace or what have you how much is is that what do you think of that as far as how important it is to have your art tell the story or this exhibit is going to be about you know this social event or well on, on a very thing. wide scale of things wider than politics or the planet or any of that i mean you know all right i'm a painter i'm not you know I'm not saving lives right now or something. I don't know if I am. I think I'm affecting people. I've sold a lot of paintings over the years and they're in people's homes. And it, I, I don't know, a poetic side, I've thought this out. I think that artists do one painting their whole life and it's all the same painting, different aspects, almost like a diamond, you know. So it's up to you as an artist to really, really walk the walk and not to BS yourself or others, okay? And that's vital. If you're doing that and you want to justify it because uh, you needed uh, food that day or something, okay, you know, but if, you, if, if that's like a constant thing, really, or a fallback or something, look, if you have two arms and two legs, and a brain or some sort or a will go do something else you know it's okay that's not you know and, and I don't mean to be like you know take my bat and ball and go home and you know be like sour about it I mean, it's like there's different kinds of people that are artists many 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 different kinds of people and there's different kinds of people that impose their ideas of what it is to be an artist but then there's the art and the art itself, you know, you have parameters uh, on a, like a canvas, like a painter. So just talking painting now. Yeah. There's a scale. You're working this by this, you know. Now, you can allude to things that are not on the canvas. But right now, for maybe a moment, you have someone's point of view, someone's attention that's looking at your work. 
and this is what they've got to work with. So you're pushing edges or you're not pushing edges. You're creating forms that go into other forms. You're creating dreams. You're, you're, you're creating, you're dispelling dreams. Whatever you're doing with it or trying to do, whatever you're trying to communicate, be clear about it. And that's it. And, and as far as on a grander scale of things, um, I don't think, and I used to think as well, you know, you could paint your way into art history or something like that. Unfortunately, because of cell phones and, and, and the way a compression of information, visual information nowadays, I think history itself is getting compressed. And I don't think there's an audience that is waiting for the next art history book to come out or something. You know, it's not unfolding like that. It's not at that pace. So um, a lot of the work is reactive shit, excuse me, but, and it is that, and it might be good for that week and that Instagram post or whatever. And um, there's no resonance. So if you want to do good work, and my, for my opinion is yeah. the work has resonance. Does it have to have a, do, do art, do gallery owners and art dealers, do they want a story? Do they need you to have a story? First of all, I'm not a gallery owner. I'm not an art dealer. So, okay. But, but from seeing a lot of, yes, some do. Part of it is, is Look, I used to sell like movies, I told you a long time ago. Like, they want a synopsis. They want to make it easy for them to sell. Right. Is it the artist's job to make it easy for them to sell? No, but it is the artist's job to communicate with the galleries clearly what they're trying to communicate and maybe to work out a story for them to sell, but not while you're painting or not while you're making the work. Um, and it's it's not about making myths up or fiction up um look there's always going to be uh, art galleries and there's always going to be new people in those galleries sometimes the people that are selling in the world, they're very distant from the owners of the galleries mm. or they're very distant from the directors of the galleries but when you walk into a big gallery you might see some in my opinion kids 25 30 years old and I could talk about Warhol or you no know, Warhol they would know, but you know some people they would you know, Arthur Dove or some obscure you know somewhat obscure for them, and they would kind of not know it and kind of like check it out for a moment on you know maybe their phones or if they're really curious and it doesn't mean they're not valuable, but they're coming within their own limitations. Mm -hmm. They're working at a job. Think about them. They got to go home and they've got to feed their dogs or whatever, you know, they've got other stuff going on, but now they're in the gallery and someone walks in and they should need to communicate. What is this art about? And they need to listen to what this person, uh, is looking for maybe for art. So that's not the artist's work. Yeah. Art of making art, the process. Okay. Yeah, so you, Give me a little like my favorite yeah, part. Give me kind of like the process. <laughs> I love process. So in the morning, yeah, I get up in the morning uh, before everyone starts being on my case. I get up and I'll paint for an hour or two. I like music. I gotta have music for some reason. It's almost like a dance. I like the music. I like to mm. feel that. Yeah. Uh, I just feel like I'm, and also it takes me a little bit. Like I have to start off. I have to kind of warm up. Mm -hmm. kind of like kind of, okay. It takes me. You know, probably half an hour, 20 to half an hour, so I'm really feeling like, okay, I'm like, I'm, I'm moving, I'm in the zone or whatever. Yeah. Tell me, tell me a little bit about your process. Of well, I'm right here. I could probably show you some things uh, visually if you want. My, my, my work table is, I mean, make Francis Bacon look like he's really organized. <laughs> it's really crazy. None of my tubes of paint, you will be able to see anything, but I know what's in them just about everyone. Although I did discover a beautiful green today tube that is just, I was like, oh, wow, I forgot about that. It was like an, 
it's a it's a beautiful CAD grain that I'd forgotten about. What was the so, what was the paints you recommended? Because it wasn't Old Holland, I remember you. you, you oh, I used Williamsburg. William, oh, Williamsburg. Okay. But I also use oh Schmenke. <laughs> you like that? Oh, That's yeah. By one. by Mussini. How do you spell? How do you pronounce? S C H M I N C K E or something like that. Schmenke. And it's uh, Mussini. The Italians and the Germans got together and make some beautiful grays. At one time, they had okay. their paints. Um, so anyhow, ritual. Yeah. Well, I'm in the studio. Um, uh, I I'll have the canvas. It, it depends on what stage I'm in. When I first get it, it's it's laid down flat, and I lay down some. Depends if I'm working on linen or if I'm working on on canvas. But I, maybe I'll put down some earth tones or something just to get the canvas, just to get some things moving around. Mm -hmm. Just not drawing yet just just literally laying paint down mm -hmm. um, light and that's very physical but prior to that I I have clothes uh, most of my clothes have been destroyed because I just they just turn into paint clothes mm -hmm. I don't even wash them I've had so many you know I've gained or lost pounds in many many years so I just wear clothes out yeah. <laughs> okay and through okay I go over to that paint table, which you know, we'll have a gander at later, um, and um, I take off all the things. I get, uh, oh, okay, I'm thinking this through. I'm sorry, I don't really usually articulate this. Um, upstairs, I put some vegetable oil on my hands and fingers because they always get under my nails and stuff later. And I do. They usually come off. I use these black gloves, but um, then I put the gloves on after that, and then I get the paint clothes on, and then um, I peel away all the layers on top of that table, and then um, if I'm, let's say, a third or began a painting already, I have specific tubes of paint usually to the left or where I'm at that I used already for that. So there's a palette. Maybe I'm using a marigold yellow and uh, I don't know, maybe uh, some burnt umber and some uh, whatever, a dark blue, I don't even know, probably a, not even an ultramarine, but like a Berlin blue or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, so I've got them. I'll pour, I work in walnut oil and stuff like that. So I um, uh, work very little I'm not really working in varnish. Sometimes I work with a little bit of Damar varnish and walnut versus linseed. What's linseed oil yellows? I linseed oil is not bad. I have some still, and I'll probably use it um, soon when so I do is something else. Just clear or more it's a, actually it's a little green. It's walnut. Um, uh, yeah, they both look clear. I mean, you know, but it's a little greenish tinge to it probably, okay. and. Um, Linseed oil is good too, it looks, but it um, comes from flaxseed, I think, but it's, um, it can yellow with the exposure to the sun. Mm. You know, it happens sometimes with deep reds and stuff like that, but um, uh, I just like walnut oil. I've, I've been okay. using it for Just some curious, years. Like for some it. years, I've been using it, and I, okay. I like the viscosity of it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's a little thicker, a drop thicker. It's a little thicker, okay. Yeah. And um, I'm going to use maybe a drop of turp and maybe a little bit of, um, of Damar. That's it. Very simple, okay. simple uh, stuff these days when I work with. And then um, I start mixing. I start looking. I, I assign certain brushes to the canvas. Um, I step back and I look, you know, and I just go for it. You know. Any envir what environment do you have? Oh, oh, I have music on. Yeah, yeah. I go through different periods of Leonard Cohen, of some some just trickling brook water, nothing at all. Some this woman named Milan does this kind of. You know, she has one of these heavenly voices, and I just hear that for an hour, two hours. I really don't want any lyrics or something. Yeah. Sometimes I crank it up and I'll listen to Van Morrison or Dylan or some kind of. Right from that era but yeah, yeah. and then um, 
Cat Power I've been listening to lately. Yeah, yeah. I have different. It depends on on the. And then um, sometimes just silence. And I don't have to be all headphoned out. I have the music kind of back here in the background yes. kind of thing. And uh, phones off usually. Yeah, that's right. And um, uh, depending on the fumes and stuff, there might be a fan going. Time of day? Oh, well, this time of year, it always depends. There's a magic hour like the last hour and a half for sunlight. That, I love to paint then. Mm -hmm. But, but I paint more. Uh, color your coloring, right? Because aren't you thinking? You mean it's glowing, color? the yeah, light? Yeah, you get a little more warm. Yellowed light. Yeah, yeah, it does. It can. It can. Um, I would paint like around now, which is right, I would say three, four hours before that will happen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and towards the end it does. And then... Um, I'll move the painting around to different parts of the studio to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. I'll go upstairs and I'll look down on the painting and I'll look at it upside down mm -hmm. at some point. Um, I never turn it around and change it. Um, if I want to change, I just change on the canvas and do whatever. Yeah. And um, I, I can work wet on wet okay. as well. I know how to do that without messing everything up. Um, I keep my brushes clean. Not, I don't, you'll see that and you'll go, you're crazy, but I do. I, the ones I'm working with, and so I have some, some, uh, like orange kind of citrus kind of thinner. So I'm constantly wiping the brushes clean with, I use uh, large, um, drop cloths as rags too, and then I have rags around. Okay. No paper towel. No paper towels, okay. and um, no, never. Uh -uh. Paper gets on the canvas. And I'm very a stickler. I make sure. So then the paintings. That's that's one thing I would do. Sometimes I look at them at night under a flashlight. Really? Yeah, because I don't really like to look. I, I can't stand um, brush hairs in my paintings. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And I just go in and I take a stiff brush and I'll pick them out while it's tacky still. How funny! You have yeah, have a I mean you'll find some with brush. Yeah. <laughs> no, and it happens sometimes. And if you don't get it soon enough, then it's like in, and then I just I, I crater it out anyhow and I touch it up usually. But you won't find a lot. You know, yeah. there's some, but not a lot. I. I remember seeing a show, I won't say by who the painter was, very good painter, I really like his work, but it was at Gagosian years ago, and I was charging 175000 for these paintings, and there was brush hairs that were just not, I was like, what are you doing for that? And maybe it wouldn't matter of the price of that, but even if it was 20000 it was like, you know, too much, but yeah, so, so that's that. It's a little about the ritual, um, oh, I sway too, um, sometimes to warm up. It's quite physical, so um, my grandfather in synagogue used to sway when he prayed, so it, like, it's very meditative. Mm. And I've learned, to, when I work on the wall, which sometimes, I, I know how to do lines that are really straight just by swaying across. Mm. So I've done yoga for years, I don't anymore, actually, I should be. I play tennis too, and all that helps me with the physicality of the art. Um, I have an extra tennis racket around here and I swing it around sometimes in between while I'm waiting, while I'm cleaning up. Mm -hmm. Then I clean up, then I'll come back down and I start painting again. Mm -hmm. Then I'll clean up and I'll come back down. And that happens usually about five or six times. Mm -hmm. And I'm always ex like surprised, like, oh yeah, oh well, just better yeah. do it now. Because I always see new things in it. Right. I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe I better... Yeah prior to that. So that's some about the ritual. Cool. Let's do an AI question real quick, because I do want to get your thoughts as oh. a traditional artist, just like your thoughts on... Um, Ellen Iverson? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just, <laughs> okay. Just like the, you know, um, back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, illustrators were really pissed about photography. 
because magazines like Saturday Evening Post and Look right. and all those magazines, and now all those illustrators like Al Parker and Bob Peake and right. all these guys that I love, uh-huh. Austin Briggs, they're all getting replaced now by ads in photography, right? Okay. And so technology is always changing, and mm-hmm. somebody's mm-hmm. using a more archaic form is always kind of pissed and like, hey, you don't like mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. version. Uh, is AI just another extension of that, or is there something different in AI? Are, are, do you feel threatened, or do you feel that, maybe not personally, but as far as an artist who loves this form of communication, do you feel like um, technology with AI is an issue? Well, I will say, I think it has a different um, set of problems than other technologies that you're referring to. Yeah. Um, television versus film or whatever, you know. Um, and um, because there is uh, a creativity through there's a dynamic thinking that can be created in AI. I don't think it's human, but it's dynamic. Meaning they'll take different elements together and they'll come up with a whole other element. And as a human, it might not be the element that you would even think of, but so, so in that way, it's a creative freedom. Um, um, I, a lot of it I don't know. I've messed around with it a little bit, not artistically, uh, but with storytelling and writing a little bit. And it's kind of, you know, you have to keep feeding it right. and then you can get it, but it's amazing. It's two or three minutes and you're like, yeah. what? You know, so I'm not impervious to the, uh, the magnificence of it. Again, limitations, again, uh, sometimes might create better... Um, creative solutions and those limitations i still think are fed by humans Mm -hmm. to ai so maybe it'll force creative people i don't know about painters or how that's going to work um to get more creative about the limitations that they feed ai Mm -hmm. and what's the result of that and what's the end result of that i am not of the world that there's a finite amount of ways of creating and a finite amount of things that need to be created or can be created. Mm -hmm. And if you're creating it, you're taking it away from me. Mm -hmm. I'm a pluralist. So, um, and including artists who feel people are stealing from them. I've had people look at my work a lot because it's online a lot and some I've seen some and I felt a little funky about it, but you know, you can't, you can't, I know whatever you can say, I'm influenced by this and that and others. Okay. But you know, but then you always find things out. Um, so the owning of a creative uh, thing is, it's tricky because if you make a living off it, it's tricky. Again, that's not all up to the artist. Maybe that's up to the uh, the creativity of the people who market art and sell art, create it. So fine art painting. My mother showed me something amazing. She saw it at the Museum of Modern Art. I don't know which artist did it. He took a little bit of every piece of the entire collection of the Museum of Modern Art and made a work from it. It was fantastic too, I thought, just as a work. And you wouldn't know that unless you were told that. But brilliant idea. Yeah. yeah. And the guy had the idea, but he fed it, use AI, so he understood limitations. There was a finite. So uh, simply put, I don't know if this tells anything, you know, if you, if you want a nice draft to come into your house, you open the window by a little bit. That's when you get, that's the powerful one. If you open the window wide open, it disperses energy and it disperses the vision and it's the qualities are going to be not there. Mm, right. So I actually am thinking like that at the same time, 
the limitations is the, so I so I don't know that's kind of talking around it because I don't fully understand the capabilities nor do I think a lot of people do and I don't know if I stood in front of uh, you know or, or rather it was in chat GPT or rather I forgot what it's called the the visual one there's a mind it's mid journey that's correct mid journey is what I was thinking of how one hones it. I mean, I think I tried one thing on it. It was just a really hokey kind of animated thing. Mm -hmm. It turned me off so much. <laughs> now, in animation, as an example, when they started using um, animators electronically, you know, digitally, as opposed to people drawing from Hanna-Barbera, is there a quality difference? Yeah. But I don't know yet. If, I don't want to write it off yet. Yeah. So I don't, does that answer? Yeah. 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 Last question, John. Sure. Again, thank you so much for your time. It's valuable. And ah, you're and welcome. This is the stuff that I, I get energized by this kind of stuff. Oh, cool. So Good. It. Good. Sure. Um, let's strip away the art. Let's strip away all that kind of stuff. Okay. Let's talk about what's important in life as a human on this planet. Um, if, if you're punching your ticket tomorrow and it's all over, what is the message? What do you feel like is the most important thing? It's a huge question. <laughs> mm -hmm. What is the message you want to give to, you know, the future? What is the thing you've learned that you feel is uh, the most valuable? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I would say that um, what you're really asking me is what's my story, is how I interpret that. Okay. Because I think all of us uh, humans are, everything we're motivated to do is to feed the end where we have our story all set up. Mm -hmm. uh, the romance of I died at the perfect time and it just all sewed up together and it's all poetic and with regards to story um, there's a lot of conflict that I've had and a lot of people have had could be be an individual be a collective how to be part of the whole world how to, to build your own world you know but it's not a dualism. I don't see it in a dualistic way. In other words, I think that people have to understand that things can coexist that are incongruent and the harmony could be found from a wider point of view in understanding that there's greater dimension in allowing things to coexist that on, the, on a single plane would have conflict. So, an example. I'm not going to get into politics, but people fight over lands, they fight over, uh, you know, they fight over uh, ethnicities, they fight over, um, they fight over I'm right and wrong and all that stuff. That's coming exactly what I was talking about from a finite place. So we owe it to ourselves not to be coming from that place and to be, to be see it with greater vision, to allow there to be more dimension and greater acceptance throughout the world, including your own stuff and your own inner stuff that you've got. Ultimately, you handle your inner conflicts and through opening yourself up to allowing them to exist more than solving them. There is no audience in a way at the end, I think. And I think that it's really key that um, t to understand, you know, there's like wabi-sabi in, uh, in, in, in Japanese. There's, there's the aesthetics. There's the story that you think is perfect always has a little bit of something that is from an outside point of view is imperfect but perfection encapsulates it all in a way and it's 
its uniqueness is that as well. So it's really about accepting uh, and not trying to be right about it. At the same time, it's okay to have vision that others agree with or don't agree with, and it's, it's perfectly uh, admirable, as a matter of fact. And vision isn't about uh, imposing your views and making others wrong either. If you really have vision, you believe and trust in articulating it and doing the best you can to articulate it and letting it be as it's going to be and it'll find its way. If you don't believe in it 100% like that, um, maybe it'll find its way, maybe it won't, but you're then you're in your head thinking about it and it's a whole, it's a whole process. So, um, and uh, it's through all that comes, I think, uh, an integrity and compassion and all those big words like that, you know, and love and gratitude. So that's what I have to say with regards to that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joshua. Appreciate sure. Yeah, great. Yeah.